Welcome to the Expert Network Team Podcast. Where our goal is to inform and educate our listeners on matters related to finance, legal, insurance, accounting, and other interests that are of personal and business nature. We hope you will find our content useful as well as entertaining. The Expert Network Team consists of Carl Frank of AI Financial, Mike Miller of Miller and Associates CPAs, Jeff Cromendike of Security First Insurance Agency, and I'm Nathan Merrill. I'm an attorney at Goodspeed and Merrill. Together, our independent team combines our expertise to provide you insights and solutions, some straightforward, some profound, for real-life opportunities we see on a daily basis. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. If you'd like to learn more or desire to meet with any of the Expert Network Team members in person, you can contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. And we encourage you to take advantage of a free consultation with any of our team members. Just mention this podcast when you schedule your appointment. Now on to today's podcast. Guess so. Welcome to today's podcast. I'm Carl Frank, and with me today, we've got a full house. We've got Nate Merrill, attorney with Goodspeed and Merrill, Mike Miller with Miller & Associates, and John Sauer, an attorney and expert on our today's topic. And returning guest. <laughs> returning guest from Goodspeed and Merrill. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you today? Good. Cold. <laughs> it is snowing outside. It's very cold outside. The January summer has come to a conclusion. We need the snow in Colorado. We need it. True. I'm a, I'm a Up in the mountains. Skier. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready for it down here, too. Okay. Well, we're going to have a great time talking about a terrible thing. I, we've got three companies in the room with us today, and all three of us have been hit with this fraud. I, I just can't believe that. Yeah, well, I mean, given everything that went on last year, this is just one of those areas, I think, of vulnerability in the system that once enough money was there for the taking, the conspiring crooks out there obviously saw an opportunity to make a buck yeah the fraudsters came out in full force mm -hmm. it, it's pretty easy to find people's information online and then all this, with that you know social security number name and address they just file their and they claim. yeah and they realize that there's a very loose system yep. and i think we're going to talk about this in terms of how that stuff is vetted and and cured in processing so well it's going to be a great podcast let's take two steps back and, and tell everybody what the heck we're talking about mike what are we talking about we're talking about unemployment insurance fraud. What is that? <laughs> it is, it is. It, you know, if you're if you're laid off from an employer, it, it you know, um, at no fault to your own for a cause or anything like that. Which happened in large numbers last year, for right? Example. Exactly, and so massive numbers. So if if you're laid off uh, or, or your job's terminated, you can file for unemployment. The unemployment benefits are are state driven, and you can get whatever amount that you want. Not what you want, but what they allow by by state standards. This year, because of COVID, the feds kicked in some extra bucks, which really ramped up how much you got from an unemployment perspective. Yeah. And so, again, the people who are good at this, the fraudsters, the they know how to, 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 to get at the system. And they all um, of a sudden said, there's a lot more money that I can steal. Yeah, yeah. And so I had a client call me um, who, who's with a, a large company here in the, in the Denver area and stated that, you know, her HR department had asked her to reach out to anybody she knew that could help with this because they'd had several, you know, over like 20 people in the office that had gotten fraudulent unemployment claims against them. 20 which, claims. Which triggers, you know, a lot of issues. One, you, you get concerned about identity theft, right? Yeah. That's your first concern. Second concern is, you know, that they haven't probably thought of yet is they're going to get a 1099 form for unemployment insurance benefits when they go to file their tax return. Oh, the individual will. Yeah, yeah. And so, how do they deal with that on their tax return when it's really not income when they receive? When it's received? fraud, yeah, yeah, nightmare, nightmare. And what about the company? What's the what's the risk to the company? Um, well, they've got they they basically it's a longer process than that. They have certain rates that they pay mm -hmm. when, they, when they pay on insurance rates during the year for the number of employees. You know, on their base salary. You know, Colorado is like thirteen thousand two hundred. Uh, the first thirteen thousand two hundred, uh, they get assessed. You know, call it roughly two percent uh, gets funded into the un unemployment insurance plan. Well, when their when their unemployment rate goes up, whether actual or due to fraudulent activity, their rate goes up. Right. So now they're going to have to fight that next year to say that's a false rate. It was a false claim. It's a, yeah, it's a false rate, false claim. So this is just going to be a nightmare for not only the the person receiving the fraudulent claim, 
but the businesses that have to deal with this fallout. Everybody loses. Everybody loses. John, what's your perspective? So from the employment law perspective, this has been really the most exciting year in terms of having to learn <laughs> new law very quickly uh, and things changing rapidly. And it's just a variation on a theme that I've encountered in my practice, which is a lot of the systems and laws that were in place prior to the pandemic were not drafted in a way that could handle what was about to happen. And when you have a huge number of employees that lose their job, all of them entitled to unemployment and a system that previously was extraordinarily streamlined, the influx of billions of federal dollars and a directive from Jared Polis to get this money into Colorado employees, former employees' hands as fast as possible. What happened from my perspective at the CDLE, the Colorado agency that administers this program, was that they took off the brakes. There was no longer any review of whether an employee is entitled to benefits. There was no longer a decision made, and everybody just got paid. Wow. So is that still the case, or have they pulled, pushed the brakes on it? Have they pumped the brakes a little? So I think at this point, um, what I'm seeing in my practice, so I do a lot of uh, unemployment appeal work, advise employers on these types of things and help them through the process, is that employers are getting their quarterly statements. Some people throw that in the trash. Some people actually look at it. The people that are looking at it are finding employees that are receiving unemployment benefits that never should have been given unemployment benefits. This is one way employers are finding out that employees that are still working down the hall have an unemployment claim filed against, uh, uh, filed against them. And there was never a decision that was actually issued by the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment Unemployment Section to award the benefits. So there was never any notice to the employer that there was the opportunity to appeal the award of benefits. And you end up in a situation where what we've done is started sending letters to the unemployment section in mass. I mean, I'm sending these on, you know, five or six employees at a time saying these, these claims are either fraudulent or these employees were not entitled to benefits for these reasons. We need to set this for a hearing. And what I've received back is orders from the, the appeals section, which is the higher level than the base level decision makers. Well, there's no order in the file that this person ever should have been awarded benefits in the first place. So what are we can, what, what are you actually appealing here? And then they remand the case back down. And so in a lot of ways, I'm not sure exactly what's happening, but it sounds like if all of these cases that um, are getting it, that should have been appealed, didn't get appealed and others are following suit and sending these letters saying, we want to appeal this, the unemployment section base level is swamped in terms of trying to issue these decisions after the fact and most of the time after tens of thousands of dollars have been paid in benefits. So let me restate one thing just to make sure I'm understanding this. Normally when someone makes an unemployment claim, the employer is notified and you're given the opportunity to say, no, that person quit as opposed to was in a qualifying termination, correct? That's correct. And that hasn't been happening? That has not been happening. By executive order or of the governor or just? It's, I think that it's what's taken place in large part as a result of Polis Direct and get this money out as fast as you can. Okay, so it's like an administrative abbreviation of the process. Yes, and it's a deviation from the standard course and you know, probably like a technical violation of an employer's due process. Right. So is that statutory? I mean, maybe you and I are getting into the weeds a little. Is that statutory or regulatory? Is it an administrative rule that's being violated or is it part of the statute that's technically being violated? Well, an employer has a right to appeal an unemployment benefits award by statute. So it would be a statutory deviation. Interesting. And that process begins with the notification by the state to which the Which isn't happening. Which isn't happening. Exactly. So employers are finding they have employees that are getting unemployment benefits that they would have otherwise appealed. Presumably getting unemployment benefits because that, that's the other side of this coin is Correct. in some cases these claims are being filed by fraudsters and somehow getting the funds redirected so the employee doesn't even know. And that's the point you were bringing up, Mike, was that this can impact an individual's profile – because they're going to get a 1099G, presumably, right. at the end of the year, saying they got all these unemployment benefits. They got all these benefits. unemployment benefits, correct. But uh, so two, two types of these situations that I'm aware of, maybe you can speak to them, John. 
One is the one you just described, where it's an unemployment claim against the company which they're actually employed by. I've seen, I think I've seen some come up where it's an unemployment claim against either a bogus company or somebody that the employee never worked for. And the, so the company's not affected. The actual employer is not even aware of it. But the individual might now have to take care of this on their own. Have you seen those as well? So I've seen those, uh, and largely the question comes in with the person basically identifying that their identity has been stolen and what do I do now? And <laughs> welcome to a long road to recovery and so sad for you, but frankly, it's not an easy process to sort through. And there are lawyers that specialize in identity theft, but it's still going to take a long time and a lot of personal investment to make sure that you get your identity back. Does that claim on unemployment, do you know, does that affect credit ratings and stuff like that? Or it's just a matter of locking down all your getting credit lock or what a credit protector or whatever it is. Life lock. Life lock. Yeah, or something We're like that. one something of the like competitors. That, yeah. 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 We don't want to endorse anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Not unless they pay us. <laughs> In which case we'd be Someday. happy to do that. Yeah. So if anybody out there has any Enter- Any enterprising uh, <laughs> services who wants to take advantage of our info you know, at expertnetworkteam.com. Right. I think the really scary part is that suddenly you know that your information is in some database that's been sold on the dark web. And it's not just an unemployment claim that was filed. It's, you know, maybe you haven't checked your credit report in three or four years and somebody's taken out a loan for a car and driven it off a cliff. And suddenly you realize that it's not just the unemployment piece. You have a long list of other problems. You see, this is really scary to me because somebody, one of these dark web creeps, has figured out the social security number, the employer, the address, the name, all this information. Well, that's what I'm saying. In some cases, it's just a bogus employer. The states are so lax on this that they're not even checking to see if this person was ever reported as an employee. This might be a good time for me to tell you what happened to us. Because we had two people who are contractors, and we got the unemployment claim. So they're not even employees. They're 1099 contractors, and we got the claim for unemployment. And so imagine how surprised we were. To find out you had a couple of employees? Yeah, that was surprising. <laughs> and now we're paying extra unemployment insurance on people who aren't even employees. So I feel a little bad for us because, like you said, Mike, we're going to end up paying more until we fight this. And we'll fight it on principle, but how much work are we going to put into this? Right. I don't know. I feel really bad for them because their identity has been stolen. So, John, one other thing I want to bring up on this because it does raise kind of an employer-employee relationship issue. So we get an employee – as an employer, we get a notice that the employee has this fraudulent claim filed. What's our obligation to them? What do we have to do as an employer? What's – where do we have to be careful So I'll give you a list of shoulds because there's not any formal obligation on an employer to notify an employee of this. Uh, But the employer does have a vested interest, of course, in keeping their rates down and their fraudulent claims off the books, right? So letting the employee know that we received an unemployment claim in your name, you weren't unemployed during that time period, you should contact the CDLE and let them know. Another way people are finding out about this is the bank cards show up in the mail. They get their bank card and they, they're they like, well, I never applied for unemployment. Why did I have this money? So if you get a bank card in the mail, then you report. It's usually U.S. Bank here in Colorado. Don't use it, right? Don't, that's, don't use it. That's exactly what to happened to me. I, I got a card in the mail. Yeah. And I knew what they were because they used to issue these in my corporate life. Well, that's not very good yeah. fraud then because then they're just – Somehow they're just getting through the banking system to say, issue me a card, and, and, and there's nothing on the card. Oh, there's nothing on the there, card. Yeah, the card didn't have any balance on it. It was just a debit card. They Now, if you get an unemployment claim against it, they, they load that card okay. with whatever your monthly amount is. So maybe they're trying to intercept the mail, too? Is that... Uh, that's one thing that I've tried to be. I tried to look for is one thing that's kind of shocking is that the amount of claims is like 1.3 billion dollars in fraudulent claims have been filed, but it's under 10 million dollars have actually been paid out. Uh, so there's good checks in place. You know, if you're looking at this on a percentage basis to prevent sure. this from occurring, uh, the one thing that's open in my mind is how do these guys actually get the money? Because you would have to, if it's going out on a bank card to the home address that was filled out as part of the application, somebody's going through your mail. 
one of the suggestions, there's, an, there's a writer for the Colorado Sun that's really following this closely, doing interviews with the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment to try to keep tabs on how this is going. Um, it, she says that there's a lot of reports of these people that are conducting these fraudulent claims actually intercepting the mail. So lock your mailbox. Wow. It's not just a Colorado thing either. Uh, another example, Carl, Carl said his firm got hit. I got hit with a debit card in the, in the mail, called the Colorado Department of Unemployment. I, there wasn't a claim filed, so I, I called the bank back and went, how'd this card get issued? Because it shouldn't be issued unless there was a claim filed. Yeah. So they're trying to figure out that on their side. And then in the interim, I get a letter from, from the state of Kentucky in my name to my business office under my wife's Social Security number. So they're, they're getting incredibly creative, not only in your state, but in multiple states. Wow. One thing that adds another la layer of complexity here and makes it more of a perfect storm for the unemployment section is that as part of the CARES Act, they issued the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, which basically gave benefits to people that are self-employed, uh, gig workers primarily, which is a very you know progressive understanding of what kind of labor market we have in terms of who needs help. Uh, but at least up until December 26th, most of the claims were made against PUA, uh, against individuals that would be eligible for PUA as uh, sole proprietors or... Uh, What's a PUA again? Pandemic Unemployment okay, Assistance Program. Um, the gig workers. I and thought only tax guys were allowed to do acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> it's PUA. PUA is good. <laughs> so Sorry, it, I digress. Well, no, I mean, it's really a good point, though, because if it's PUA, right, it, it didn't exist before, so this fraud didn't exist before. Hopefully, it'll yeah. end when it ends. And doesn't the, the PUA also apply to these, when you say gig gig workers, it's also the uh, Airbnb, VRBO oh. types as yeah. well? Self-employed individuals. Yeah. I mean, so with, with that program, it ended at the end of 2020. So one of the things that is interesting now is there's a, a statistic that unemployment claims are up 63% here in Colorado in January. And there wasn't another pandemic. We're still in the same pandemic. So there wasn't a 63% increase in layoffs. There wasn't a 63% increase of people losing their jobs. And now we have the fraudsters actually targeting not just the PUA, they're targeting the regular unemployment the benefits. Regular companies. Yeah. Has this been happening to the government at all that you're aware of? Or is it just private enterprise, meaning government employees, do they have unemployment insurance? Do you know? All employees have unemployment in some form. So, you know, city workers could have uh, claims brought in their mm. name for unemployment. Yeah, I know you used to have a connection to – I won't talk about it, though, <laughs> just so you don't get hate mail or something. So I'm going I'm to reel us back in. I think we were, we were back on that one point about if, if, if you're an employer and you got hit, what would, what's your obligations? Yeah. What you had, what you had to do. And I think we covered the first point. <laughs> didn't didn't re, didn't continue on with the rest. So the first point was uh, you let the employee know. The second point is is that you uh, circle back and contact the CDLE and try to determine exactly uh, what was filed and how it was filed. Uh, and then it wouldn't be a bad idea to contact your IT department to see if there's been a breach. Uh, go through whatever other security protocols you may have in place to ensure that to the extent that information left your business that you don't have a larger problem um, because you do have an employee that you're aware of that has an identity theft issue now. And do you, do you I've heard a, a repeatedly file a report with the sheriff's department. Does that really do any good? Well, I'll say that at least as far as I know, Denver Sheriff's Department doesn't have jurisdiction in Nigeria where most of these claims are originating. So, <laughs> <laughs> Or Kentucky, in my case. <laughs> I don't think it's a bad idea to file a police report. Uh, frankly, I think that it would fall to the wayside compared to more serious uh, crimes. And it's mostly outside the purview of these types of organizations. So. But I don't know. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but there's no confidentiality. There's no special handling of this information outside of what you'd normally see when someone's social security number is involved? Well, you're required, if you have uh, 
personally identifying information of an employee to maintain it confidentially. So you wouldn't share that information with other employees and the, uh, the employee themselves would know their social security number, presumably. So mm -hmm. uh, in your handling of it, uh, you can release that information to the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment to identify the employee, and that's typically the marker that they use to identify people. Just don't send it in an email. Yeah, don't Unless send it's it in encrypted. an email. <laughs> Unless it's encrypted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you've got your employees' information. You don't have the non-employees' information, right? And so there could be a huge number of claims against my company, your company, your company, out there for people if they're not work if they're not notifying us for sure right right yeah i mean this could go on forever unless somebody changes something i think that it's very important that you read the mail that comes from the Colorado department of labor and employment uh, and that's the primary way i've been getting calls about this is we've got five employees that we didn't ever get noticed that they were applying for unemployment and we would like to oppose it or we'd like to figure out they're still working for us why they are getting an unemployment check and when you have businesses with large workforces, it, I imagine it would be easy for some of that stuff to slip through. It's absolutely easy to slip through. It's boring. It's not easily comprehended if you are not interested in it. So, And it's a huge waste of time. Oh, it's a huge waste of time. Completely non-value-added work. Yeah. Just, yeah. A, just time suck. Really Our apologies to anyone whose job that is. Yes. <laughs> Send your email <laughs> to <laughs> Carl. <laughs> Wait, what's up with that? Um, I would say it's not a total waste of time, especially right now in this environment. And that's because you're right that the your calculation of what you owe on an annual basis is determined based on the claims. And if you have a ton of fraudulent claims or a ton of claims where you would have otherwise opposed, but you never received notice, it's worth going through the process despite the headache and uphill battle it is to get things right to uh, affect your bottom line on what your payments would be. But at present there's no um, known activity that would relieve this burden from what has been created as a a new business burden there's to your knowledge no administrative actions or remedies that are being proposed there's no administrative actions or remedies that are being proposed they're um, just expecting time will take care of it i think that they're expecting employers to be diligent about this and let them know if they find fraud it falls to the people that are paying the bill to actually make sure that the bill is correct Lucky you, business owner. That's the American rule, isn't it? Yeah, except for they're the ones cutting the check on our behalf, so it's just it's kind <laughs> and of... We have no control over that process. Right. I mean, yes, we cut the premium check, but we weren't the ones that created the problem. Isn't that the truth? That was under my breath <laughs> that I said that. John, any parting thoughts? Stay diligent. Uh, make sure that you're checking your credit reports, checking your quarterly reports, um, and be safe. Very good. Thank you, John. That was very important. With that in mind, we'll send you back out on the road into the snow, John. <laughs> <laughs> be safe. <laughs> Great, a beautiful day. Thanks. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the information we shared. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to share it with someone else and join us next time. If you want to meet with a member of the team, please contact us at, at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's info at expertnetworkteam.com. If you have special topics you'd like to hear about, please reach out to us and let us know at the same email address. Again, that's info at expertnetworkteam.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We want to remind you that listening to this podcast does not establish a client professional relationship with any of the firms represented, nor does it constitute legal investment or accounting advice, and the views are those of the professionals only. Investment advisory services may be provided through ANI Financial Services, and securities may be provided through Genios Wealth Management.